these are backwards. But uh, okay. Um, over the years, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has been a topic that has had a profound impact on my art and research. Um, efforts to contact extraterrestrial intelligence inevitably call for concise answers to fundamental philosophical questions about who we are and what we know. Human activities on our own planet uh, have precipitated global environmental changes and the extinctions of numerous species. What's more, almost every part of the human race has exterminated some other part of the human race since before recorded history. Meanwhile, messages transmitted to other stars have nevertheless intended to imply that Homo sapiens is a friendly, peace-loving species with rational scientific attitudes and family values. While SETI messages include purported universal mathematics, graphics, and audio frequency content suitable for the human sensorium, any extraterrestrial sentience would be wildly unlikely to be compatible with our own. The least ambiguous parts of our most serious messages for extraterrestrials are the messages they contain for human beings themselves. We are, for instance, genetically far more similar with, say, tomatoes than with any conceivable alien species, but the tomatoes nevertheless refuse to speak to us. Over the past three decades, I've carried out several projects centered on ideas about extraterrestrial communications that have in turn given rise to new scientific techniques and inspired new forms of artistic practice. Microvenus was a proof of concept model for biological interstellar message carriers. Um, huge numbers of biological agents with robust archives can now be transmitted across vast astronomical distances and enormous periods of time. But an even newer form of interstellar transmission falls just within the realm of possibility. This would be an interstellar message created explicitly for, explicitly for human beings rather than for aliens, a swan song with precise reports about the human condition that might be used to break the wheel of time. But to properly explain all this, I'm going to have to back up a bit. In March 1975, Wisconsin Senator, U.S. Senator William Proxmire sent out his first press release identifying wasteful government spending. He called these monthly bulletins Golden Fleece Awards, and they became a popular feature of his Senate tenure. In 1978, he awarded the National Aeronautics and Space Administration one of his Golden Fleece Awards for spending millions of dollars in efforts to find intelligent life in outer space. <coughs> Federal funding for experiments involved with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was promptly discontinued. Private donors continued to fund S SETI research, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence acronym is SETI. They funded it to some extent, but the level of support from individuals and private foundations could not compensate for the loss of government support. Meanwhile, some scientists conveniently suggested that sending messages into space might not have been such a good idea after all. In keeping with the SETI funding moratorium, a kind of SETI-phobia set in. Many scientists don't actually fear interstellar warfare, but instead fear for their personal and professional security. Could their organizations handle the public backlash if they uh, decided to transmit? In 1897, H.G. Wells published his science fiction classic, The War of the Worlds, in which Earth was invaded by squiggly Martians fleeing their arid, dying world. Besides being scientifically plausible in terms of its times, Wells' novel had a political message. An impotent of British colonialism, he wanted his countrymen to imagine what imperialism was like from the other side. And since then, ever since then, tales of alien invasion have been a staple in science fiction. 
Physicist Stephen Hawking has compared prospective contacts with advanced extraterrestrials with the disastrous initial contacts between European conquistadors and Native American civilizations. Um, like many conquering armies of the past, conquistadors killed all of the indigenous males and took all of their women. And so there is an obvious conclusion. Uh, Richard Carrigan, a particle physicist at the U.S. Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Fermilab in Illinois, went so far as to suggest that even passive monitoring of extraterrestrial signals would render our own civilization vulnerable to extraterrestrial computer viruses. Watch out. So there are SETI parameters for transmissions on it with using the medium of radar, and any Earth-based interstellar radio transmission is constrained by two principal conditions, atmospheric opacity and powerful solar background. You have to have um, uh, between 1 and 10 gigahertz, and that's the uh, frequency that Francis Drake transmitted from Arecibo in 1974, he transmitted a powerful signal that could outshine the sun. These frequencies between 1 and 10 gigahertz are the frequencies that best transmit through atmosphere. And at a relatively modest 1 million watts, uh, Drake's signal would be seen to be brighter than the emission expected in that part of the spectrum of any G-type star, sun-like star. With the exception of the 1987 Poetica Vaginal transmissions from Haystack Observatory in Massachusetts, for more than 35 years, no one would transmit radar signals into space that were powerful, powerful enough to be detected from the vicinity of another star. While on the one hand, we search the cosmos for technologically advanced intelligences sufficiently like our own that we might uh, have some chance to successfully interpret incoming messages, we're also searching for intelligence that are significantly unlike our own since we search for intelligence in other stars that actually transmit uh, interstellar messages. Frank Drake's November 1974 message was one of the last serious attempts ever made by human beings to transmit radio signals to other stars. This is um, Frank Drake's coder. It's an instrument at uh, Arecibo that um, interrupts the radar beam, and he's transmitted 1,679, 1,679 ons and offs of the radar, and these were considered to be seen as zeros and ones. Um, so, to understand that, you have to understand that a prime number, a prime number, it can only be divided by itself or one, so it can't be factored any further. Every other whole number can be broken down into prime number factors. Determining the prime factors of a number is an example of a problem frequently used to ensure crypto cryptographic security and encryption systems. This problem is believed to require something called super polynomial time in the number of digits, meaning it is relatively easy to construct a problem that would take longer than the known age of the universe to solve on current computers using current algorithms. So if you're an intelligent alien from Cleveland, um, you would know that 1,679 could be rastered into an array suggested by its prime factors, which are 23 and 73, and only one of several comp compilations, right to left, left to right, top to bottom, bottom to top, only one iteration, iteration contains the intended graphic, and then with another great leap of faith, um, the intended information might be interpreted. Another problem is that mathematics may not be uh, such a universal concept after all. Uh, mathematicians and philosophers have never been able to agree what mathematics is in the first place. Thus far, only Homo sapiens and closely related primates have exhibited any indication of mathematical comprehension whatsoever. So, let's see, in 1986, I reiterated uh, astronomer Frank Drake's 1,679-bit uh, transmission from Arecibo 
in the form of 1,679 generic glass bottles and partition racks. Empty bottles represented the binary character zero, and water-filled bottles represented the binary character one. Uh, these 1,679 characters contain Drake's universal message for extraterrestrial intelligence. I put these in the Hayden Lo Science Library at MIT, where all the information you need to interpret the message exists, where all of the information the message refers to exists, and supposedly better than average terrestrial intelligence exists, but they just argued about whether it was art or not. <laughs> so, in addition to messages encoded as radar signals, some interstellar messages have been sent out on board spacecraft. Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft in 1972 and 1973, respectively, were launched with trajectories that would ultimately take them beyond the local solar system. Um, they, they contained incomplete uh, illustrations of human anatomy by L Linda Saltzman Sagan, uh, Carl Sagan's ex-wife. Uh, Likewise, in 1977, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes were launched into trajectories that would ultimately take them to interstellar space. These spacecraft also carried message materials intended for extraterrestrials. Both the Pioneer and Voyager messages contained censored images of human anatomy, either no nude human images at all, in the case of Pioneer, uh, nude human figures devoid of external female genitalia. Um. Meanwhile, we're mystified by numerous reports of aliens coming down here to abduct us to experiment with our sex organs. They must be curious. <laughs> so in 1986, I put together a project called Poetica Vaginal at Haystack Observatory, um, Millstone Radar at Haystack Observatory in Massachusetts. This is the uh, vaginal detector. Um. So we... We used an analog to digital converter to create a binary map of the vaginal contractions, and and, the way, and we also created an analog map um, using the 1.07 millisecond radar pulses at 30 hertz center frequency. We phase modulated each one of these 1.07 millisecond pulses with an analog signal. And so, Poetica Vaginal not only contained voluntary and involuntary vaginal contractions, but also the detector was so sensitive it uh, registered voice, respiration, heartbeat, and other autonomic audio frequency human physiological signals. In fact, this transmission contained more information about human beings than all other SETI messages combined. So we used harmonics, we gen used electronic music studio software, MIT electronic music studio software, to generate harmonics from the, um, from the vaginal squeezes. This was, I was collaborating with Todd Macover's grad students at Media Lab. And uh, these were, these, when they, when they reached the frequency of one of the 44 sounds of English speech called phonemes, um, we had bitmapped um, the, these phonemes by, with Professor Tanya Reinhardt, uh, late Professor Tanya Reinhardt, a student of Noam Chomsky, and a professor of linguistics and literary theory at Tel Aviv University. It, it had a kind of Israeli accent. Um, so then we were able to print the print the letter with this exotic phonetic alphabet, and I'm going to have to take this off. Let's see here. Bear with me just a second. Sound? Is there a sound? Try again. So, long story short, I'm the first guy in history to ever have a conversation in English with this part of the human anatomy. <laughs> so, there were some lessons learned. 
characteristics of interstellar radio propagation and the economics of signaling show that such a beacon would need to be operated on a vast time scale, and it's not an efficient way to send an interstellar radio signal. Um, in addition to, to this problem, there are issues of atmospheric opacity and solar in the background of solar emissions. There are also fundamental problems with radio character with radio characters that have to do with the fact that radio signals are made out of photons and photons diverge uh, according to the inverse square law so um, so that uh, an object twice the distance from the source will receive a quarter of the amount of the illumination um, so that effectively you have to be in the middle of the beam to receive the signal at all um, and precisely in the center of the beam. Drake's transmission was only for three minutes, a single transmission in a single direction, and yet there are 400 billion stars. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the problems with Drake's transmission, Fra Frank Drake is uh, an astronomer, and he should know about the proper motion of stars. Um, stars are rotating, the stars in our galaxy rotate around the galactic core, much like uh, the planets rotate around the sun. Um, so, uh, over the course of centuries, stars appear to maintain nearly fixed positions with uh, respect to each other, so that they form the same constellations over historic time. Uh, however, precise long-term observations show that the constellations change shape, albeit very slowly, and that each star has an independent motion. Um, so it's sort of like pin the tail on the donkey. Uh, I should be back. Let's see. How come I'm not back? Yeah. Uh, yeah, pin the tail on the donkey. Uh, Another problem is that the speed of light is really a slow boat over astronomical distances. Homo sapiens appeared about mm, 100,000 years ago, approximate time of divergence from uh, the common ancestor of all modern human, human populations was about 200,000 years ago. Um, our galaxy is, about, is conservatively about 100,000 years across, light years across. Sorry, I hate these ear mics. Uh, so, if the mitochondrial Eve had managed to get the right frequency and the right power to transmit a signal to the other side of our own galaxy and it had been received and immediately replied to, why the signal might not be back yet, and meanwhile, um, Eve evolves into a different species. Um, so, even if Frank Drake's reasonably local SETI transmission ultimately proves to be successful, we're still going to be waiting in the chapel with fresh flowers for the spouse for 50,000 years, new descending and descending and descending the staircase, bachelors waiting to strip the bride bare. Uh, problems associated with messages attached to spacecraft are much worse, while while these are among the fastest objects ever created by human beings, they will not reach the planetary environment of another star for at least a billion years, which is as far ahead as anyone can predict. So there are three basic problems. You have to be robust. You have to be able to survive the message itself. You must be able to survive the extremes of space, of the space environment, temper, temperature, radiation, vacuum, etc. You have to, this message must be able to remain intact for periods of geologic time, and it has to be abundant enough. There has to be hundreds of billions of copies for hundreds of billions of possible recipients, and for this, bacteria, especially sporulating bacteria, answer all these problems very well. I sat in a bar with my friend and colleague, uh, Dana Boyd, uh, the Plow and Stars, it's about halfway between Harvard and MIT, and we, we calculated on the backs of napkins um, how many spores would fit into a pint of Guinness, a metric pint, 500 milliliters, and our, our conclusion was that we would have about a million per star system in the Milky Way. That's not a lot, but it's someplace to start. 
So, like Poetica Vaginale, Microvenus was created to respond to arbitrary censorship of messages depicting human anatomy and messages human beings have sent to aliens. But it's also been widely uh, recognized as the first work of art to utilize techniques of molecular biology, the first bioart. Artists have long since been concerned with what I call issues of transanimation, power over those qualities of vitality and function that distinguish life and death. Um, here is Moses throwing down his staff, uh, Moses' rod, turning it into serpents, and Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing. But these stories uh, are reiterated over and over again, and through the history of culture and literature all over the world, there's stories of Midas and Medusa and Daphne and Srinx and Shalotl and Quetzalcoatl and many others. My favorite one is the story of Pygmalion and Galatia. Pygmalion was a sculptor king in ancient Greece, and he, he carved this beautiful woman, woman in, in stone, and he fell in love with his sculpture. And, uh, he lamented so terribly that the goddess came and brought his sculpture to life. That was Galatia. So in addition to these poetic motivations, Microvenus was created to represent possible technical solutions for problems associated with all attempts to use spacecraft and radar transmissions for interstellar communications. Um, Microvenus was the first genetically engineered work of art and the first use of bacteria to model um, biological carriers of interstellar messages. Microvenus explored the notion that biology could play an important role in sending astronomical numbers of directed messages across many thousands of light years and correspondingly enormous periods of time. The data encoded into microvenous bacteria consisted of a simple line graphic. Later projects addressed the production of more complicated data in biological form, including text and high resolution picture data. Um, this one was the first uh, text encoded into uh, DNA. It was called The Riddle of Life in 1995. It reiterated an important episode in the history of science. It encoded the English language sentence, I am the riddle of life. Know me and you will know yourself. I have limited time, or I would explain that episode in the history of science. We'll skip that for now. Um, so I had done low resolution graphics and texts, and uh, I wanted to, uh, in the late 90s, I, got, I wanted to explore encoding high resolution computer data. And the first high-resolution digital image coded in DNA was the Milky Way DNA. It was featured at Ars Electronica in later in the year 2000. It encoded an image captured by NASA's cosmic background explorer, the COBE, it was called satellite, uh, into the physical minutia of DNA molecules. The Milky Way DNA juxtaposed these vast differences in scale. The Kobe images were the first images human beings were able to capture of the galactic core of the Milky Way, and they enabled the most complete maps ever to be constructed of our own galaxy. But as the body of information to be encoded into DNA grew larger, new kinds of problems appeared. Um, there were preferred codons. Certain organisms like certain codons and don't like others. Some codons are pathological sequences. Um, it's astronomically unlikely uh, that you could code, say, an encyclopedia into DNA and then accidentally make a patho pathological sequence, but it's possible. Um, if you create DNA that's useless to the organism, the organism will try to modify it or delete it o over time. Um, Large amounts of DNA cannot be directly inserted into the DNA of living organisms, therefore, without being specially coded, not only to keep parity with the desired input information, but also to be sufficiently biochemically and biologically friendly to successfully coexist with the host organism. So I started coming up with a series of DNA programming languages that answered these problems. This is called DNA supercode. It uses um, 
the four mononucleotide triplets in the genetic code uh, CCC, TTT, AAA, and GGG to specify those respective bases. In nature, three other triplets in the code are used to terminate the translation of genes into amino acids and proteins, and these are called stop codons. Uh, the supercode uses these stop codons as specific uh, programming statements. Um, TAA is one of them. It means factor the following sequence until encountering another stop codon, then delete this codon. TGA means unedited sequence follows. It's fine until encountering another stop codon, then delete this codon. And TAG, the, uh, the last stop codon, means delete the following sequence until encountering the next stop codon. This statement allowed for the insertion of specific sequ sequences where DNA can be cut with special enzymes called restriction enzymes. Unique restriction sites, effectively file drawers that can be opened and closed uh, in yellow um, over here. Um, this, this let me uh, open the drawer, correct any error, and then close the drawer again. Um, so the four mononucleotide codons, CCC, TTTA, GGG, uh, and the three stop codons leave 58 codons remaining in the 64 triplet codons in the genetic code. Uh, DNA supercode assigns mathematical, mathematical base 20 values to each of the remaining 58 codons so that they can be used to specify numbers of repeats in a given base, of a given base in the coded sequence. This is useful since input data may call for long uh, repeats of a single nucleotide, but such long repeats are difficult to accu accurately read by conventional sequencing methods. Sorry, Mars. Uh, um. uh, that, yeah, their long repeats are, can't be read by conventional sequencing methods, and because long repeats um, impart the same electromechanical torsions uh, time after time, to a strand of DNA causes loops and other curvilinear structures that can't be effectively processed by cellular machinery. Um, another problem. Another problem is uh, you have to conserve the data. You have to pick some places in an organism where it's not going to be thrown away and where it's not going to be useless. And, uh, and so... Here, there are, in red are the 20 amino acids, um, and, and there are 64 codons, 64 triplets in the genetic code, but only 20 amino acids. So some of the codons redundantly code the same amino acid from two to six codons code the same amino acid. So you can give them number values, which I did by uh, molecular weight. Um, I tried not to be arbitrary. And so underneath the gene, I could write a sequence. Of, I could write any number, put any message. But this was not the most efficient way to hold information. Um, then it occurred to me that each DNA molecule, three mer, three rungs of the ladder or longer, can be specified by three unique numbers. Um, one of them is the amino acid. It has a base 20 number. One of them is the DNA itself. And one of them is this silent code. Um, but the, effectively, that means there are three pages of information available. One of them is uh, the protein that the DNA is supposed to make. One of them is the DNA itself. It still leaves an open page, which I could put a map of a precise map of a hypothetical but, um, but precisely described DNA, second DNA molecule which itself has three pages of information. One page holds input data, one page is the DNA itself, and the next page is another hypothetical but precisely described molecule, which it in turn has three pages. So we learned to put layers of information under a single gene, and this turned out to be much more efficient. So, <coughs> In 1999, uh, scientists at the Department of Physiology and Physics at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York uh, got, 
got funding from the military to code messages in DNA, so they coded uh, a famous message that said June 6 invasion Normandy, which uh, was 50, no, it was 22 characters versus the riddle of life, which made four years earlier was 56 characters. Later at the European Bioinformatics Institute Wellcome Trust Genome Campus in Hinkston, England, in 2013, 739 kilobytes were encoded. Um, and George Church, I think it was, that was like 2012 or something, George made the first book in DNA, um, Regenesis, the first complete book in DNA. And then in 2016, in collaboration with Technicolor, they put the first motion picture in DNA, um, which was a trip to the moon. Um, University of Washington and Microsoft researchers um, put 200 megabytes of data uh, in DNA in 2016. Um, and they, they expect to keep 10 terabytes in a few milligrams of DNA, but I don't think they've actually done that yet. Um, so, but anyway, George Church and Sri Ram Kasuri had already beat that figure with technology to contain 5.5 petabytes of, uh, of data in DNA in 2012. Recently, this year, uh, scientists at Columbia University and the New York Genome Center um, put Shannon's manuscript on information theory, math, uh, uh, the Calibri computer operating system, the a movie of the arrival of a train, and the pioneer SETI message plaque uh, into DNA. Uh, they extrapolate that one gram of DNA with their method called DNA Fountain would contain 215 petabytes of data. But see, all this is, these were attempts to create, to encode data in raw DNA, in naked DNA, DNA that wasn't in an organism, um, but to, as is, the case with DNA that we read from the past, the most secure and longest lasting way to store information in DNA is to have it carried by an organism. Naked DNA is vulnerable to destruction by bacteria because DNA is food and enzymes called DNases that are ubiquitous in the environment. Um, so we've been exploiting a natural viral defense system called um, CRISPR, uh, which uh, allows us to specifically insert and detract and subtract DNA in very specific places throughout the genome of cells of a cell. So my church lab benchmate, you know, Seth Shipman, um, announced an entirely new form of information keeping in DNA in November 2016 at the TEDx Beacon Street um, in Boston. Um, I'm not going to show you, I, was, I had selected some clips, but again, I don't think I have time. So, uh, collaborating with fellow lab mater, member Jeff Navala, um, like our ancestors who left images on cave walls, we used this system to represent a human hand. Um, and because it's a viral defense system, it's conserved in the cell, and we thought, well, let's go further, and we put a movie, and this is the first movie encoded into living bacteria. It's uh, Moybridge's running horse. We're now talking about doing 3D stereo movies and holography, and uh, I've had a project going for several years where to clone uh, 50% most visited pages of uh, Wikipedia and the most ancient apple, uh, Malus cerevisiae from Kazakhstan. These are my apples growing in uh, Harvard greenhouses where they must remain until I can build something like this. It's um, uh, a greenhouse, basically, that's uh, isolated from the environment. It can't allow for 
insect-borne uh, cross-pollination or airborne cross-pollination because apples readily cross-pollinate and these apples are recombinant. And uh, I've been begging for money, but I think I've accepted a, an opportunity to teach for a semester at the University of Kentucky. And in, in return, they've given me access to their metal shop in the Department of Art. I'll be teaching in biology, but I'm going to build that. So techniques for improving the information handling capacity of DNA are right now being created with the potential to replace the internet. This is how we can create messages for the deep future. We can invest the terrestrial biome with all the legacies and dreams of culture and civilization and the entirety of human history. This is our message board. This is where we will leave our mark. We can create an archive that will be forever immune to censorship purges and iconoclasm, a message board to persist through mass extinction events and terrible natural catastrophes. But wait, I'm not finished with radio just yet. Knowledge of molecular biology was in its infancy in the years when uh, investigators created, um, carried out the first searches for signs of life in distant planetary systems and the first transmissions of messages intended for intelligence on other worlds. Um, radar was invented 80 years ago, radio astronomy 86 years ago, the first SETI experiment 57 years ago, but uh, DNA sequencing was only uh, 40 years ago. No gene at all was sequenced until 1972, and routine sequencing of DNA was not possible into until 1977, several years after Drake's famous transmission of an encoded image of the DNA helix from Arecibo. Um, it seems likely that SETI involvements with astrobiology may grow to include an examination of large genomic libraries for influences of extraterrestrial origin. The fact that human beings have already created significant data archives in the DNA of living organisms leads directly to the idea that we may engage in the search for corresponding caches of information that may have been intentionally transmitted across great distances in time and space. I can imagine new initiatives drawing together great minds in biology and informatics to create the tools necessary to foster such a search, and in fact, I'm now a consultant at uh, SETI Institute where we are considering SETI version two. In 2009, uh, I was invited to address the University of Puerto Rico's biology colloquium just by accident. It happened to be the third coincidence. It happened to be the 35th anniversary of Drake's transmission. And so uh, my colleagues, um, Irving Vega and Al Wunderlich, who flew in from California. Al is the emeritus professor of painting from the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, Ir Irving Vega is a professor of biology at, uh, at the University of Puerto Rico. And so we approached Arecibo Observatory saying, we need to send biological messages into space. So on the 35th anniversary of Drake's Arecibo transmission, I interfaced my iPhone and subsequently transmitted messages to three nearby stars. Um, for the full story, again, I don't really have enough time to uh, explain everything, but you could take a picture of that with your phone maybe and check it out. Um, the message contained data precisely corresponding... Whoops, what happened here? Sorry. Wow, this computer just... Help. <laughs> um, the, the message, reboot it. Just reboot. It's not even rebooting. It's probably aliens. Uh, the message contained uh, the gene for Rubisco, the most abundant protein on Earth. It's um, 
a protein involved in the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. It takes inorganic carbon from the atmosphere and turns it into food. It's one of the most ancient and uh, one of the least efficient proteins. Um, its efficiency, the level of efficiency probably accounts for its abundance, but it is one of the most ancient proteins. We human beings don't have the gene for Rubisco, but, um, but all of the complex carbon we're made from was at one time or another created by this protein. So go to view presenter, 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 there, yes. Come on, wake up. <coughs> so the coder, the same coder that um, Frank Drake used was at Arecibo that would have let me send a binary message, but it was broken. <coughs> yep, this is the Calvin cycle of... Damn it! Ask for what? So skip it. Let me. Let me, uh, but this is not a complex slide. That's just a regular, that's just Calibri, it's a regular. So let's escape. All right. Try that one. So this is the, the bitmap, the D DNA converted to binary. Um, which is only slightly larger than Frank Drake's original message. And this is the Rubisco gene converted to base four. Um, this is DNA and base four, which are the same, CTAG, based on math zero, one, two, three. Um, this is Drake's coder, which was broken. And so I, had to, I only had so much time in between experiments to uh, pull this off. And so I was racing against time to figure out how to do it. Um, so uh, this is the riddle of life. This was the message um, that I coded into DNA in the 90s. But I was inspired by this message because it reiterates the Edict of Apollo at the Temple of Delphi in Greece, where on the gates at the entrance of the temple it said, know yourself and you will know the secrets of the gods and the secrets of the universe. Um, and I coded these into, uh, into bacteria and to toothpicks. That's part of the history. Um, but I couldn't... Um, break up the message into uh, zeros and ones, and so I had to figure out a, uh, an analog way to put this information. And so I used, for zero, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, I used uh, one syllable, two syllables, three syllables, and four syllables in I am the know yourself riddle of life. And I don't, I know that alien intelligence wouldn't be conversant in English language, but the signal nevertheless contains discrete physical maxima punctuated with precise intervals. Um, let's see here. Um, 
so that the message holds a sequence of 1, 2, 3, and 4, or if extrapolated as DNA, the corresponding sequence of C, T, A, and G. Um, and so this is the message, part of the message for the gene. These are the stars, and this is the iPhone that transmitted the first interstellar phone call. Here we go. I know yourself, I, I know yourself, I know yourself, know yourself, know yourself, I know yourself, we'd love life, know yourself, we'd love life, know yourself, I am the know yourself, know yourself, know yourself, we'd love life, I know yourself, know yourself, we'd love life, and the etc. People give me a hard time for having such an old iPhone, but it's coolest iPhone on earth. <laughs> so this got a lot of attention in scientific and popular media. Um and it also caused astronomers, because no one had transmitted a message for 35 years, to get to go crazy. They went excited, got very excited, and um, uh, and in the wake of Proxmire's vilification of SETI research, um, comments from the scientific community suggested that under these circumstances, only non-scientists could effectively transmit interstellar messages. And in the end, there was no short of a shortage of opinion about where I should send the next such communication. Um, at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, six years later, scientists were still squabbling about whether or not, whether or not to send messages. Douglas Vacock, who is the head of Medi International, said. Quote, I'm not going to, you guys can read, I'm not going to, it's terrible to read slides. Uh, so, some scientists, I got bombarded with the email, and some scientists suggested that I send messages to uh, Dyson spheres. Um, in 1960, physicist Freeman Dyson postu uh, popularized the idea that Truly advanced civilizations were more likely to evolve around dwarf stars than around medium stars like the sun, because dwarf stars, stars can persist for billions of years longer. He suggested that in order to soak up the maximum amount of radiation from these uh, small stars, that in a truly advanced civilization might engage in huge, gigantic astro engineering projects that would enclose their stars and span entire planetary systems. Um, I was told to look for an infrared source without a stellar companion, and that would be a <coughs> that would be a Dyson sphere. But another response uh, submitted to a blog post about Rubisco stars, that was the name of the project that transmitted Rubisco, turned out to be much more intriguing. The writer recommended that I transmit messages not to a star, but rather to a black hole. We got a black hole coming up here, don't we? Yes. So black holes are persistently mysterious entities that invoke a whole series of inexplicable paradoxes that continue to confuse physicists and probably very much to the universal delight of artists and philosophers. These paradoxes include the black hole information loss paradox, a complicated puzzle resulting from the combination of quantum mechanics and general relativity. The paradox arises because in every other case, all information about a particle must be permanently conserved. This also implies um, a violation of conservation of energy. Uh, problems with causality, which we'll discuss shortly, imply the famous grandfather paradox. And there's another one called the firewall paradox that seems to violate the principle that a particle cannot be fully entangled with two independent systems at the same time. The suggestion was that I should send a message not just to any run-of-the-mill black hole, but instead to a rapidly spinning supermassive black hole called a Kerr object. And 
one of Einstein's famous, and the reason I should send it to a Kerr object is because Kerr objects tend to smear space-time. One of Einstein's famous thought experiments was about two identical clocks, where one clock is left at the train station and the other clock is placed on the train and then the train goes around and the two clocks come back together and they show different times. Um, this phenomena um, is because the clock on the train was in motion while the clock at the station remained at rest. Uh, Time dilation, in, dilation in, remo in relation to motion was actually first described not by Einstein, but by, but by Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorenz. And Lorenz published his transformations in 1899 and 1904, whereas Einstein published the basics of his special relativity theory in 1905. Um, even though time dilation figures importantly in Einstein's special theory of relativity, he neglected to credit Lorenz, Lorenz in the first edition. Nevertheless, it was because Lorenz laid the fundamentals for the work by Einstein that this theory was originally called the Lorenz-Einstein theory. Lorenz transformations define the property of an interval between any two events in mathematical models of space-time in relativity. Lorentz transformations describe only transformations in which space -time, if the space-time event at the origin is left fixed, like Einstein's clock on, clocks on trains. So this inspired several experiments for, of my own experiments. Um, these, are, uh, these are little paradoxes, too. Um, Doc Edgerton was a good friend of mine. He, Doc Edgerton, the f who made, invented the strobe light, who made the famous photographs of bullets shooting through apples, which he made at MIT. And uh, to my disappointment, he had only used 22 short caliber um, bullets, which are subsonic. Um, and then when I looked around, because I wanted to sh fire supersonic rounds um, to increase the Lorentz transformation, uh, the only firing range in the whole, there was not, none at Harvard, none at MIT, none at uh, Boston police, none at the Cambridge police. The only place in Massachusetts where you can safely fire a sniper round is at the Boston State Police Academy in New Braintree, Massachusetts. And, and uh, they let me go there and shoot these bullets. Um, and also uh, Jim Bales from Edgerton Center. This was several years after uh, Doc Edgerton died. So this one is traveling at two point Mach 2.7, 2.7 times the speed of sound. This one's traveling at uh, 3.1 times the speed of sound. While a fixed bullet is sitting still, these are um, perfect examples of Lorenz transformation. Both of these bullets are on different timelines, but they're sitting in the same um, same frame, and there's also this interesting mystery going on. I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but there's a, a red flare in front of the supersonic bullet that um, appears both. This one has a red ballistic tip, but this one doesn't, and there's still a red flare. And physicists have been, ever since these experiments, have been all over the world arguing about what the hell that red flare is, and uh, nobody knows. <laughs> uh, so the fastest objects um, created by human beings. Um, I wanted to like get something faster. The, the time it takes for a bullet to get here to there is all the time you have to work with, so you can't accumulate much of a Lorentz transformation. Um, aircraft might be an answer. Um, the North American X-15 secured a record speed of 4,520 miles an hour in 1976. Uh, but flight times ranged up to approximately 12 minutes, not enough time. And uh, in 1976, NASA launched the solar probe Helios-2 to measure electromagnetic radiation emanating from the sun, and it reached a top speed of 157,000 miles an hour, but we can never get it back, so I can't run an experiment. It's still in elliptic elliptical orbit around the sun. But it turns out the fastest sustainable velocity that that's available to us on Earth are the ultra centrifuges in biology labs. Um, they can spin around at Mach 5. And so I decided to solve this ancient problem about the chicken and the egg. 
and I went to Humboldt University and collaborated with my friend Reinhard Gessner, and um, we and I got chicken and I got egg and um, and uh, we, I I had a choice. I could send, I could spin around like for eight days in the Mach five ultra centrifuge. I could accumulate a Lorentz transformation of one one hundred thousandth of a second. Never mind that it would take a thousand years or something more than that to do a whole second, but um, one hundred thousandth of a second was sufficient to solve this problem. And I could have put either egg or chicken in the centrifuge and send them into the future to precede all other eggs and all other chickens. Um, but I sent 1.5 gram egg and 1.5 gram chicken. Buddha would like it. Problem solved. So, Lorenz, 1899, uh, Einstein, 1905. By 1918, Austrian physicists Joseph Lenze and Hans Thiering postulated that these time dilation effects were unfolding in astronomical contexts too, and predicted that the rotation of massive objects like planets would also distort the space-time metric. This phenomena is now called frame dragging. So, drag, frame dragging effects around planet-sized objects like Earth that spin around about a thousand miles an hour or so uh, were proved uh, later on with uh, experiments with spacecraft. Uh, one of these is the Lagos. And it's an interesting tale about Lagos. It's a, a massive inert object with these mirrors all the way around it. And it's in this stable orbit that it's supposed to stay up there for 80 million years, 8.4 million years. Um, it's an aluminum clad solid brass 903 pound two foot diameter sphere with hundreds of prism reflectors that now um, orbit about 4,000 miles above the Earth. The stability of the orbit is so great that it will not be dragged in by Earth's atmosphere or gravitation for an estimated 8.4 million years. And it contained, these satellites contained Sagan's last a message for advanced civilizations, but these messages weren't for little green men. Um, that because this thing is going to hit Earth, it's for our descendants, and it has um, it has uh, maps of uh, of continental drift, and it shows what we thought, what we think uh, continental continents appeared at uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, and when the satellite was launched and when what the continental drift will be like when the uh, satellite l lands. Very little known, but this was Sagan's last message to space. Gravitational time dilation is a difference of elapsed time between two events measured by observers at varying distances from a gravitating mass. Um, relative to Earth's age in billions of years, the Earth's core is effectively two and a half years younger than the surface. Uh, the closer to a gravitating mass, the slower the clock. Likewise, considered over the lifetime of the Earth, the clock set at the peak of Mount Everest would be about 39 hours ahead of a clock set at le sea level. Uh, a clock further away from a gravitating mass runs faster. Uh, and time dilations due to height differences dilations due to height differences of less than one meter have been verified in the laboratory. Uh, this effect is significant enough that global positioning systems, uh, artificial satellites need to have their clocks corrected. And since everything in our universe seems to be rotating, differences in distance from a gravitational mass correspond with different rotational velocities, just like in the centrifuge, and orbits of greater angular velocity result in larger amounts of time dilation. These effects are assumed to be much more profound around extremely massive objects that rotate at relativistic speeds, like Kerr objects, uh, the spinning black hole. Owing to space-time distortions and depending on the mass and direction of rotations, phot photons would appear to move either faster or slower than light as they passed around such an object from the viewpoint of an observer. Depending on the observer's perspective, photons such as radar signal might therefore be detected that would appear to be coming from either the past or the future. These enhanced frame dragging effects are expected to be confirmed within the next few years as 
uh, precise astrometric measurements of certain stars approaching the supermassive hole uh, at the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxies are measured. Um, a black hole, even the most massive singularity, is thought to be infinitely small and yet powerful enough to choreograph the motions of entire galaxies and swallow billions of suns. The ergosphere is a postulated region around a black hole um, from which matter can't, but energy can escape. Um, all forms of matter and energy are thought to be consumed at the event horizon or the inner horizon, horizon of a black hole. But unlike the fate of particles of matter, an electromagnetic wave, such as radar, that transited the Schwarzschild radius of, or ergosphere of a black hole would be stretched but not destroyed. Thus, any signal to be transmitted to the vicinity of a black hole would comprise a signal of the shortest possible initial wavelength. Likewise, the data content of any such signal may be highly compressed. Um, effects evolving, involving photons and electromagnetic waves are not the only strange temporal effects thought to be associated with the rotation of supermassive objects. Physicists have described uh, phenomena occurring in the vicinity of black holes called closed time-like curves. In this special scenario, the destiny of a material particle, a particle of matter, in space-time is closed. That means it can return to its temporal starting point. Uh, the possibility of such an event was confirmed in 1949 by Kurt Goodell, who discovered a solution to the equations of general relativity known as the Goodell metric. Uh, an exact solution of the Einstein field equation that allowed for the existence of closed time-like curves. Goodell gave these calculations, this proof, to Einstein on his birthday. Uh, since then, other solutions to general relativity uh, equations containing closed time-like curves have been found that imply at least the theoretical possibility of time travel backward in time. A message received from the message I received from the astronomy blog in 2009 implied that if I were to send a radar signal that would transit the ergosphere of a rapidly spinning black hole, it might be detected sometime in the past or future from the point of view of an observer, perhaps even before such a message was actually transmitted. Um, according to some general relativists, if an object were to pass through the center at an appropriate angle of incidence, the object might in effect pop out in a remote region of space-time within our universe, past, present, or future, or into another universe, or perhaps into some weird parallel universe. My response to this was to compose a message called Swan Song to be transmitted to a black hole in the constellation Cygnus, one of the most studied astronomical objects in its class. Cygnus is a com summer constellation, still visible, I believe now, and throughout the Northern Hemisphere. It's part of a binary star system about 6,070 light years from the sun. The primary star in the system, HDET226868, is a magnitude 9.0 massive supergiant, blue supergiant, listed in the Henry Draper Extension. The Henry Draper Extension was published in 1920, between 1925 and 1936, and it's an expansion of the Henry Draper Catalog of Stars, and 1936 is key, as we will see. Unlike elaborately encrypted interstellar messages for extraterrestrials, for presumed extraterrestrial intelligence, Swan Song is an interstellar message for human beings, and as such, it's composed as an English language message in international Morse code. The body of the message refers to all preventable deaths from genocides and terrible accidents, catastrophic natural disasters and disease, including a partial sequence of the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, that put together have cost many millions of human lives. Swan Song lists these calamities beginning in 1935 for good reason. So this is the message. Uh, it's all oh, the most. It's like I have an hour between experiments when the radar or systems are checked out 
for four minutes before the next experiment starts. And um, that's how I was able to send Rubisco. It was all confined to this limit. So it was like editing human lives. It was a difficult message to construct. Um, but it goes on. It's a dark, dark message. HIV sequence. This swan song may, in fact, be the last song. Granted, it may, in fact, be astronomically unlikely that such a message would, excuse me, ever be successfully received, but if it were, the receiver will have to have detected it with radar, which wasn't invented until 1935. The first radio telescope was created in 1931 by Carl Jansky, an electrical engineer, an American electrical engineer, Grot Reber, uh, inspired by Jansky's work and built a parabolic radio telescope uh, in his backyard in 1937. Uh, the message, uh, it, well, this guy, w Robert Watson Watt, um, and his colleague Arnold Wilkins successfully, first successfully demonstrated radar using a BBC transmitter uh, in 1935. So, let's see. It, it doesn't really matter uh, so long as the, it doesn't, so the, it's 6,070 light years away. It doesn't matter uh, if how far away it is so long as it gets shifted sufficiently into the past. Um, If successful, the message will, would, I'm having trouble with tense here, will, would have arrived long before the message was actually transmitted in any case. Um, and there are some strange twists to this story. There's something called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. The first of these events was announced in 2007. They're radio waves that are polarized in such a way that suggests that they had transmitted near extremely dense, massive objects, uh, or objects with extremely powerful magnetic fields. The brevity of these bursts means that their source has to be small, hundreds of kilometers across at most, so they can't be from ordinary stars. Current theories imply that the radio were, these radio bursts might be linked to very compact objects such as neutron stars or black holes, and they all fit a pattern that doesn't match what we know about cosmic physics. To calculate how far the bursts have come, astronomers use a concept called the dispersion measure. Each burst covers a range of radio frequencies, um, and electrons in space scatter and delay the radiation so that higher frequency waves make it across space faster than lower frequency waves. And the more space the signal crosses, the bigger the difference or dispersion measure between the arrival time of high and low frequencies and the further the signal has traveled. If taken at face value, these dispersion measurements would imply sources for bursts at all at a precisely regularly spaced distances from the Earth, but billions of light years away. Of course, no one knows what sort of signature would be imparted to a signal traveling backward through time. Astronomers have proposed a range of exotic hypothetical explanations for FRBs, including collisions of neutron stars and various entirely theoretical entities, including extragalactic, extremely distant blazars and magnetars. There are now more theories for FRB origins than there are observed FRBs. Some scientists say a more likely explanation is that the FRBs come from somewhere much closer to home, from a group of objects within the Milky Way that nat naturally emit shorter radio frequencies after higher radio frequencies. Um, stranger still is the fact that these fast radio burst dispersion measures are all multiples of a single magic number, 187.5. No known natural process can explain this. Another very good question is just why do these um, uh, dispersion measures have such a strong correlation to Earth's integer second? There is only a 5 in 10,000 possibility that this lineup is coincidence. 
A most tantalizing, if remote, possibility is that the source of these bursts might be a who and not a what. If none of the natural explanations pan out, an artificial source, human or non-human, must be considered. Occam's razor. So, in 2010, I reapproached Arecibo Observatory to solicit the transmission of swan song, and at that point, Arecibo was in a process of administrative transition and permission to transmit the message was declined. Um, I also approached MIT's Haystack Observatory, where I had transmitted Poetica Vaginal. I promise no vaginas. Um, the, uh, and they referred me to the United States Air Force, who were contracted from MIT, had contracted the radar, and uh, I, I, Air Force program directors at Vandenberg Air Force Base, um, and they contracted it for space surveillance activities, and their reply assured me that I could have some of their data, uh, but not all of their data, but I didn't want any of their data. Um, they sent me these forms. <laughs> Anyway, then uh, I, I, by this time I had contacts in the international astronomy community and I approached um, uh, Ivpateria radar in peacetime Ukraine, uh, but it was unavailable owing to diminished service lifetimes of then irreplaceable components, these huge klystron tubes that were uh, critical to radar performance. Um, this 70 meter radar at Evpateria is the second largest radio telescope in the world. So I just sort of got the notion that everybody wanted some of these people to die. Why was everybody turning me down? Um, this wasn't, uh, you know, this was to save the world. So I sent out the message body to uh, astronomers worldwide. Uh, um, Though the coded message contained my name, I suggested that the message could be transmitted anonymously without publicity or fanfare and that it could be carried out during the normal interval between experiments when radar apparatus are tested for various operational parameters. Um, and I, I also said in order to protect the privacy of collaborators that it wouldn't be necessary to notify me personally that the swan song message was actually transmitted. According to plan, I got no response or acknowledgement for astronomers for several weeks. Then, a very strange message appeared in my ma mailbox from an astronomer at Cornell. He brought to my attention the book Star Begotten, a Biological Fantasia by H.G. Wells, which was published in 1937 and dedicated to Wells's friend Winston Spencer Churchill. Now. I'm a pretty avid, I, I have to read a lot of technical literature, but I'm an avid recreational reader too, and I read a lot of science fiction, and I have never, had never heard of this book. Um, Wells's book is about Joe Davis and biological messages from space. Um, chapter one, the mind of Mr. Joseph Davis is greatly troubled. Chapter two, Mr. Joseph Davis learns about cosmic rays. Uh, Winston Churchill had radar in 1937, which is why a few years later England won the Battle of Britain in the air war against Germany. Um, Battle of Britain with 2,600 Luftwaffe planes to the Royal Air Force's 640. It was the use of radar that turned the tide. So if you don't believe me, there's the URL to the Project Gutenberg um, text. This year, um, a manuscript written by Churchill about alien life appeared. It hasn't been released, but it was reviewed by a scientist in, uh, um, in the journal Nature, I believe. Yep. And uh, uh, it's not being released for some reason. Mysteries. So, <laughs> how to survive in a strange world after sliding into an alternate timeline? I mean, will we know the timeline has changed? I mean, if the message was transmitted and it was received, then the timeline would change, and then the next Joe Davis would press the button and a different message would be sent, and the next, it's causality par paradox. Um, 
in the last few days, we've heard quite a few about quite a few apocalyptic scenarios, extinctions, events raining down from heaven, and the suffocating menace we pour into our own atmosphere as a result of a human appetite for energy. We live in a scary world. There are a lot of bad dreams out there, and the scarier it gets, scarier it gets, the more bad dreams seem to appear, and that's the problem. Returning to the legend of Pygmalion for a moment, we can see that there is a form of transanimation that we neglected to consider before. This is not transformation of base metals or mythological beasts. This one, a P Pygmalion effect in social science and psychology that shows how we bring our beliefs to life. Our beliefs about others influence our actions, which in turn impact the beliefs of others about ourselves. These beliefs then lead to or cause the actions of others that in turn reinforce our beliefs about them. This process of self-fulfilling prophecy has been a topic of study in sociology and psychology and in philosophy. Uh, if we decide in advance that Friday the 13th is going to be a really bad day, it probably will be. So, since all of our dreams are going to come true, then we're going to have to kind of count on some of us having a few good dreams. Feeling lucky? Perhaps it shouldn't be surprising that a project like Swan Song would find itself connected with science fiction. Granted, the connection between Swan Song and H.G. Wells may simply be strange and serendipitous coincidence. But a plot element in another science fiction story, Larry Niven's Ring World, suggests that serendipity itself may become a directed, tangible quality. Niven's Ring World introduces a fictional alien race called Pearson's Puppeteers, who carry on secret genetic experiments with human beings for six generations. The purpose of these experiments was to enhance the good luck, or what might be called a propensity for serendipity, through sur surreptitious breeding of human subjects. Teela Brown was a Ringworld character who had been genetically selected for luck. The alien puppeteers saw to it that human reproduction would be affected by chance so that luckier people would have more children, and those children would in turn inherit that luck. Through the process of natural selection, the quality of luck was expected to become more robust and widespread in each successive generation. In point of fact, serendipitous phenomena are sufficiently commonplace that almost every human being in the course of an average lifetime is likely to encounter such an experience. These can include highly improbable experiences like winning the lottery, I won the lottery, um, or surviving a plane crash, or more mundane occurrences like being in the right place at the right time or running into friends in distant places. This history of scientific discovery it contains many examples of unexpected accidents that through some form of enabled reasoning or clever deduction are newly transformed into opportunity. These have included the discoveries of radioactivity, nuclear fission, cosmic microwave background, x-rays, electromagnetism, electric current, plastic, penicillin, hallucinogenic properties of LSD, and many more. Serendipity, like other basically intangible qualities, uh, creativity, love, altruism, grace, patience, charm, may not seem to be appropriate subjects uh, for influences of inheritance and genetics, but there are no reasons to believe that such correlations are absolutely impossible. Investigations of some of these behaviors have been undertaken in terms of psychology, cognitive science, information science, and economics, but until now, no serious biological or genetic studies of serendipity have ever been initiated. In reality, production of enhanced or desired traits in Homo sapiens, such as those envisioned in Niven's ring world, would require hundreds of years. By comparison, a single ge generation of laboratory mice can pr be produced in only 12 weeks. So, like Niven's puppeteers, I decided to investigate the genetics of serendipity in the laboratory using 100 outbred heterozygous mice. Lucky mouse. Uh, my current experiment involves a mouse facility at the University of Kentucky and is being jointly investigated by professors Ashley Seifert and Jeremy Van Cleve of the University of Kentucky, Dana Dalbo of Concordia University in Montreal, myself, Ishvar Ilyer, and others at 
Harvard's George Church Laboratory, and Larissa Belchick, a landscape architect committed to understanding the aesthetics and humane values of human-animal interactions. Eshvar and I have built several machines that allow mice to throw dice. Uh, this is mouse machine version two, less friction with point bearings and more efficient reduction drive. Um, this is Ashley Seifert with mouse machine version three, which is already morphed, and version four is currently underway. Uh, we are doing this in the right way. Uh, I mean, first suggestion was, oh, we can just do this in the garage and we'll be able to tell if we have a lucky mouse, but nobody, if, if we don't go through all the protocols um, for animal care and use, and uh, they would say, you, those guys didn't do it right, and so we are, we're doing 100, our forms of 112 pages of animal care and use protocols, we're faithfully observing all experimental protocols for animal use, we've included sophisticated statistical analysis, and using techniques of mammalian genetics, we'll crossbreed high rollers as well as low rollers for control, and we expect to produce four generations in about one year. Thanks.